Next up on Book TV, Ann Coulter argues that immigration is the greatest issue facing the United States today and contends that America's immigration policy is deeply flawed. She's joined in conversation by Breitbart editor-at-large Ben Shapiro, who opens up the program with commentary on current presidential candidates. Hey everybody, thanks so much for coming. It's wonderful to see you here at a special evening with Ann Coulter. Sorry for the slight delay in timing. Uh, there's, as you know, relocation from the Nixon Library here because of the size of the venue. And so we wanted to make sure that anybody who mistakenly went over to the Nixon Library got a map and got over here. And believe it or not, there have been a fair number of people who have done that. So we're giving it a little bit of extra time. In the meantime, you're going to have to listen to me talk a little bit because they pay me for that and you don't. So I want to ask... Uh, let's do a quick straw poll, because those are fun and useless. So, let's go through a few candidates. Okay, how many hands for Jeb Bush? You can be honest, we won't stone you, it'll be all right. All right, nobody's that brave, okay. Okay, let's see, let's see the hands for Ted Cruz. Okay, it looks like about a quarter of the audience. Okay, how about Donald Trump? Okay, and I'll give you two more candidates, and I promise you we won't go all the way down the list because then we'll be 10 o'clock at night before we actually get here. I'm not going to ask about Jim Gilmore. Um, so, okay, how about Marco Rubio? Okay, fair number for Rubio. And, and Scott Walker, who announced today. Very interesting. Very interesting there's a big crowd for Scott Walker. Walker obviously announces today, but it seems to me that obviously an odd amount of enthusiasm for Donald Trump. And it's it's... Odd in one sense, and it's obviously not odd in, in another. It's odd in the sense that Donald Trump is by no measure a conservative. If you look at his record, if you look at his record historically, he's not a conservative. Donald Trump two years ago was criticizing, criticizing Mitt Romney for being too conservative on immigration. He was saying there needed to be a pathway to citizenship. Donald Trump a few years back was a pro-choice guy. Now he's flipped and he's become a pro-life guy. Donald Trump, we still don't know where he is on same-sex marriage. Donald Trump has proposed not just an income tax, he's actually proposed a wealth tax which would mean that if you a 14% wealth tax, which means all of your assets, 14% would be gone. So if you have real estate holdings, you would actually have to liquidate your real estate holdings in order to pay his wealth tax. So Donald Trump is not a conservative, but there's this big outpouring of support for Donald Trump. And the reason that there's this big outpouring of support for Donald Trump is two reasons. Both of them are good. One is better than the other. The first reason, which is not so great, is because Donald Trump has been smacked by the left. And the way we on the right work is when somebody gets smacked by the left, we immediately go to, okay, this must be the greatest person who ever lived. <laughs> which explains both the love for Donald Trump and the, and the continuing love for Sarah Palin. Palin says a lot of good things, she really does, but there's this kind of outsized support for Sarah Palin, largely because she was so unfairly attacked and maligned by the media, which I think everybody agrees with. And so everybody went, okay, we're with Sarah because the media hates her so much. That's an okay reason, it's not like a really spectacular reason. The real reason why people support Donald Trump, the real reason why people support Donald Trump is because he is capturing the moral narrative in the country right now. Because when you watch Scott Walker, and I don't know how many folks here actually listened to or watched Scott Walker's announcement today, a show of hands, anybody who, who actually saw it? Okay, so a few people, yeah, a fair number of people saw it. If you watch, I watched Scott Walker's announcement today. And when I watched Scott Walker's announcement today, it was very nice. I mean, it was, it was all this stuff about his record and how he had broken the unions and how he had a vision for the country and how he was going to take on foreign policy. Very nice stump speech. He delivered it as well as Scott Walker can, which is to say he was articulate. He's not a very fiery guy, so it's pretty even keel delivery. Um, and he did it without notes. I mean, it was, it was impressive in that sense, a 45-minute speech without notes. Unlike Trump without notes, it was actually coherent and actually had a linear structure to it. And, but there was one problem with what Scott Walker did. And you could tell the problem with what Scott Walker did when you listen to Hillary's speech this morning. Hillary gave a speech in New York at the News School. And in this speech, which was all about her economic plans, Hillary Clinton dropped one line about Scott Walker. She only dropped one line about Scott Walker. She dropped one about Rubio, one about Bush, and one about Walker. Those are the three she considers to be the front runners. And her line about Walker was kind of interesting. She said, Scott Walker wants to, I believe that the word that she, that she used was something like squash the unions. Stomp, thank you. It was stomp the union, exactly. She used the word stomp. And then she suggested that it was mean-spirited. 
right? That was her, that was her whole appeal. And it was, her speech was about 40 minutes long and full of all these very obscure policy proposals about the continuing uh, about continuing interest rates on income tax, all this stuff that nobody cares about and has ever heard of, the Buffett rule, which nobody understands or cares about. And the, but the only thing that that was designed to do was to elicit an emotional fear response in people who are members of the left. That's what it was designed to do. And this is what the entire left does. Right? This is what the entire left does about Trump, for example. Right? They say, Donald Trump hates Hispanics, Donald Trump hates Latinos, and thus Donald Trump wants to hurt you. Right, this is what the Confederate flag debate was about. The, who cares about the Confederate flag? No one cares about the Confederate flag. It hasn't been relevant in the country for at least 50 years, and before that, for 100 years. Right, I mean, this, the South lost the Civil War news bulletin. Right. And the fact that this became a massive cause celeb among the left, that's because what the left was attempting to do, and it's very clever, is white guy, white racist, shoots nine black people in Charleston. The entire country says this is evil. White people should not shoot black people because it's racist and evil. And there's tremendous outpouring of support. Everybody is unified. And the left goes, we can't have that. Because if people realize that Americans actually get along with each other, that we're actually nice people, and we don't need the government to cow us into submission about all of this, then we won't vote for the left. So somehow they have to find a way of dividing people. And so the way that they divide people is specifically by going out of their way to find causes that they can then blame on people. So they couldn't go with, he's a Republican because he wasn't Dylan Stormroof. So instead they went with, he liked Confederate flags. That's not very strong. So what they went with after that was, he likes Confederate flags, and a lot of Republicans like Confederate flags, therefore Republicans secretly believe like this guy and want to shoot black folks. Right? This is the attenuated logic they use. And they use this with Trump also. Trump doesn't like illegal immigration, thus he hates Latinos and wants to kill Latinos. Well, I promise you, nothing Donald Trump has ever said murdered a 32-year-old woman in San Francisco. And what Donald Trump did that nobody else is picking up on, and this is something Republicans should, instead of just shaming Trump and pretending that he's unimportant, what Republicans should do, and I'll conclude with this and then we'll bring Ann over and get to the real star of the show, but what, what, we really, what Republicans need to do is recognize that what Trump does and what he is so incredibly effective at in his own kind of brusque and rough way is Donald Trump says there is a villain to this story. There's a villain to this story. And we have to face down the villain to this story. There are bad guys and there are good guys. And you can either be on the side of the bad guys or you can be on the side of the good guys. And by doing that, he channels the anger that everybody feels, where we feel like, yes, there are bad guys and there are good guys. We're not all well-meaning people who just want what's best for the country. There are people in the country who want what's worst for the country. And because Trump says that, he generates a lot of sympathy for himself. And all the other Republicans don't have to agree with Donald Trump on anything or everything. But what they should do is they should recognize the power of what Trump is doing and the power of narrative in the battle, and they should pick up on that, and they should use it to their best advantage. Now, Anne's going to come over, and, uh, and then we'll get started. So just a few more minutes, and we'll be ready to go. Thanks so much. So you guys ready to go? All right, um, Ann's here. Uh, I'd like to bring back up Ben. Big round of applause for Ben Sparrow. Come on up here, Ben. <laughs> and uh, without further ado, let's uh, please give a nice Orange County welcome to Miss Ann Coulter. So this will be a rarity. I've both read the book and we can have a substantive talk about it. So this will That will be unusual for me. I know. So why don't we jump right in because I know that people have their own questions that they want to ask as well. So obviously, why don't I start with the question that my, uh, my co-host asked you uh, just the other week. I'll, I'll strangle you like I tried to strangle him. <laughs> uh, so my co-host asked you about the title of your book because... Because That's liberals what they do. are utterly unimaginative. How many times are we going to have to, oh, but your title's so provocative. Yeah, that's what you do. You try to get people to read your books. And I, I'm thinking an interesting title works better than, in fact, I keep wanting to email Thomas Sowell, one of my heroes, and tell him, you've got to let me come up with the titles for your books. <laughs> 
you're my favorite writer, but this, you know, basic economics. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the reason that I think that uh, people are reacting to the book, obviously, is, is because there, we're, we're in sort of a catch-22, and I want you to address this, and that is that the left refuses to talk about this topic until someone says something inflammatory, at which point they won't stop just yelling that people are saying inflammatory things instead of talking about the topic. Right. It's very common. So how exactly do we break through that? Well, I think it's a worse catch-22 than that. I mean, we're in a pincher movement. If it were just the American people against the Democratic Party, we would win. If it were just Americans against the media, we could win. But it's the American people against the Democrats, against the businesses, against the Republicans. I mean, just to get this topic, immigration, talked about, it, it's, it's nearly impossible. And pe I think people don't realize how much the media sets the agenda of what you even think about. We could go out to a bar right now, um, and ask people, what's your position on what happened in Ferguson? What's your position on gay marriage? What's your position on, on global warming? They've all developed positions. They've thought about it. Immigration, well, I guess you folks in California have thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it's really interesting how much the media determines. The, these are the items we're allowed to talk about on today's menu. And no, you may not choose any items off the menu, uh, which is why... Uh, although apparently I called him a clown a few years ago, I am so happy to see Donald Trump in the race <laughs> because, wow, he's changed the agenda. We're talking about immigration. Now they're lying about immigration, but that's, that's better than not talking about it at all. So speaking of Donald Trump, obviously he's, he's gone, you know, He's had a big jump in the polls. Uh, y you don't back Donald Trump for president. Oh, I totally do. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. He's, he, he got an advance copy of my book. He obviously read an advance copy of my book. <laughs> And he, um, he said that at a private meeting Friday night. He was very generous. He said his, it was funny, he said his sister always tells him, um, you've written more books than you've read, Donald. And he told a crowd about this size, but I read Adios America, and all of you should too. So I thank him for that. I wish he'd mention it more on TV, because I really think it would help him. I want people to read my book. I'm one of the few authors who writes her own books. I believe I am the only author who researches her own books. Um, and and it's shorter than it looks. Uh, it's fun. Um, the chap chapters are short, and when you get toward the end, they're even shorter. There are 120 pages of footnotes, so it's way shorter than it looks, and you can totally read this book, so please read the book. <laughs> it, it is written in language, folks, that even Democrats can understand. Um, and so, so let's start from the very beginning. You say that the, this is the greatest threat facing America, and I think this is a hard sell for a lot of even Republicans yes. and conservatives who have been told that ISIS is the greatest threat or Russia is the greatest yes. threat or taxation or social policy. Why is immigration the greatest threat facing the country? Well, first of all, I'm assuming a lot of you are, are Republicans or conservative Democrats, and it just it feels like we have been overwhelmed with wave after wave of loss. Obama is elected. Obama is re-elected. There is Obamacare being upheld twice by the Supreme Court. Gay marriage voiced on us. Um, the, um, Obama withdraws our troops from Iraq. I am a ferocious supporter of the Iraq War. Um, and I can't believe Obama comes in and gives away our victory. I, I mean, I hate him for that more than I hate him for Obamacare. Um, None of this had to happen. It is all the result of Teddy Kennedy's 1965 Immigration Act. Uh, without the 1965 Immigration Act, the post-1970 immigrants, very different from the pre-1970 immigrants. So I don't want to hear any weeping about your grandfathers. Um, but we'll get back to that. Uh, the post-1970 immigrants are what got Obama elected in the first place. He could not have been elected without the post-1970 immigrants who have been voting 8 to 2 for the Democrats. Without Without the 1965 Immigration Act, Romney would have won a bigger victory against Obama than Reagan did against Carter in 1980. I think probably some of you were as surprised as I was the day at 3 a.m. election night. Huh, I thought he was going to win that. We'll get used to saying that a lot more. Huh. I thought we were going to win that election. What happened to that state? Um, how did we get Obamacare? Well, Al Franken was the 51st vote for Obamacare. Uh, how did he win? Well, he, he cheated. But he wouldn't have been within, within shouting distance of cheating 
but for 100,000 Somalis now living in Minnesota who were instructed by the first Muslim congressman, Keith Ellison, you must all vote for Al Franken. Uh, without Obama as president, we wouldn't have Sonia Sotomayor. We wouldn't on the Supreme Court. We wouldn't have Elena Kagan on the Supreme Court. All these losses didn't have to happen. So whatever you think the most important issue is, it's not. I mean, even now I get this sense, and, and from talking to people, you run into d Democrats, and especially working class Democrats, saying, you know, I have had it. This, the Democrats have gone too far, this hysteria over, you know, taking down Confederate soldiers and changing the name of the Jefferson Monument and, and the fake rape cases and Obamacare and gay marriage. That's it. I'm voting Republican. Hellfire will rain down on these Democrats. Well, that might well happen, but Americans are about to be over, outvoted by other voters, by foreign voters the Democrats have brought in. Now, that's only talking about the political aspect, because I'm assuming this audience <laughs> cares about the political aspect and why should you care about this issue more than anything else certainly if you're a Republican but it's more than that in order to bring in voters who will vote eight to two for the Democrats we're bringing in extremely primitive cultures and this is most of what my book covers um, to, in order to make it short and very readable it's 100 pages of footnotes is way shorter than it looks you gotta <laughs> read it um, I, I ended up cutting 200 pages a month before we went to press but what I wanted to keep in, and I thought it was important to keep in, um, were gang rape, child rape, incest rape. We are bringing in peasant cultures. It happens that Latin America is the peasant culture closest to us, but that's not the only one. Oh, no, no, no. This, these are very common behaviors, as are driving drunk and dumping your crap on the ground. I mean, it is changing our culture in ways that the rich don't experience. It's never coming to Knob Hill in San Francisco. It's probably not coming to Newport Beach. It's not coming to Park Avenue. No, they just get the cheap maids. While Americans are the ones bearing the cost, not only in terms of taxes, in their schools being overburdened, in massive you know, school lunch programs, the hospitals are going bankrupt. No, it's ordinary Americans who are paying the cost. And most of all, I would add here, are African Americans. I mean, has, has anybody in the media checked with or as I've recently been instructed to stop saying African Americans, American blacks, <laughs> because that is what I mean. I'm not talking about a guy whose father is a Kenyan. Um, American blacks. <laughs> and they're, they're the ones who are coming up the socioeconomic ladder, who are just getting a foothold, who most of all whose jobs are just being wiped out. Have you seen the black teenage unemployment rate? Well, we have an obligation to our fellow Americans and our fellow Hispanic Americans who are also competing for those low-wage jobs. But the rich don't care about that. They want the cheap labor. They want you to pay for it. And they act like they're the ones speaking for Lupe the Maid. Well, no, you're not speaking for Lupe the Maid. Lupe would like her wage raised. Lupe apparently decided to immigrate to America and not to Honduras or Pakistan. Lupe wanted to live in America. I would like to live in America. But the elites don't. They want to live in Brazil, where there is a very, very rich upper crust, and the rest of us are their servants. And that is what you're seeing. You have seen since the, the deluge of these very peasant cultures on America in order to give the Democrats votes and the, and the rich, cheap labor. Um, you've seen a massive increase in income inequality. And which state has the most income inequality? You're in it. California, which state has the least income inequality? Utah, one of the most monochromatic states. So, you know, liberals pretend they care about income inequality. They pretend they care about the working class and raising the minimum wage. Here's an idea for raising the minimum wage. Stop dumping low-wage workers on the country. Then it will rise naturally through the laws of supply and demand, as it has in Australia and New Zealand. 
So, there's a lot there, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you want the David Brooks xenophobia question first? Or do you want the... Sure, okay, what's let's that? Take that? I one. never so, read David Brooks, so I'd be curious. Well, that, that's why you're smarter than I am. Nor does anyone else, I think. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. <laughs> David Brooks' only audience are the actual people at the New York Times who hire David Brooks. But, um, but David Brooks, yeah, over the weekend, he suggested that Donald Trump was, was using textbook xenophobia in order to drive out the vote, um, and suggested that any anti-immigrant rhetoric, essentially anti-legal immigrant rhetoric, and talking about different different cultures that, that are not as good as Western civilization would be xenophobia. How do you counter that? Or how should people in the audience counter that? Because we get this on a regular basis, obviously. Well, um, I suppose, I suppose if, if you're only talking about people who have no right to live here, yeah, you bet I'm xeno-opposed. I'm not <laughs> afraid of them. I think they're wrecking the country. Um, but as I say, they're wrecking the country for the people already here. Uh, the racism question, which I talk about a lot in my book, no, 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 no. The reason Americans are sensitive to the race issue, particularly, is because of the legacy of, of slavery and Jim Crow. That's why, that's why we have civil rights laws. That's why we have affirmative action and set-asides. Uh, but then suddenly one day, out of the blue, we, we, people used to talk about integration all the time. It was integration, you um, don't discriminate against black people, which we had to you spend a hundred years teaching the Democrats not to do. Um, <laughs> but that is all about American blacks. It's not about someone who has never set foot in this country before. It's liberals who are the racists who say, oh, you're all brown, we're going to treat you like American blacks. And it's, it's, it's really kind of shocking. I mean, I don't know if probably maybe some of you know this. Jesse Jackson used to stand at the border denouncing the illegal immigrants coming across. Um, Cesar Chavez denounced them as wetbacks, driving down the wages of the poor. Um, but today, you can arrive from, um, you know, the Sudan yesterday. You will get affirmative action applying to college. You will get, uh, you will get affirmative action applying for government business loans. One of the, one of the tricks the um, cheap labor devotees pull um, when talking about, oh, all the jobs being created by immigrants. Well, first I should start by saying, um, I've said this before, uh, Whenever it comes to immigration, it is always like the first line of Anna Karenina. The truth is always true in the same way. The lies are lies in their own ways. Um, so you always have to look at the studies to see what the lie is. And one of the lies about how immigrants create so many jobs, that's based on how many small business loans they get from the federal government. Well, they get affirmative action for that. <laughs> I mean, you're kind of chasing your tail here. Um, and by the way, how many businesses of those were successful? But as for xenophobia, look, David, what's his name, Brooks? <laughs> no, I get him confused with Brock. Um, look, he and the rest of the Manhattan elites um, and the farmers in need of cheap labor refusing to mechanize, um, no, they'll be in fa I mean, it's, there has to be a restriction at some point. They're xenophobic the same way any country is. How many people are there in the world, like five billion? Seven billion? billion? They're getting to close yeah, to okay, seven, they'd yeah. all like to live here and collect welfare in America and, and, you know, have a nice life here. We're not taking them all, so at some point liberals are cutting them off, too. They will cut them off as soon as um, every person they know who went to college, or at least one of the better colleges, um, has a maid, a nanny, a pool boy, a gardener. Once those needs are taken care of, <laughs> okay, that's it. Sorry, Bangladesh you're not coming in. <laughs> so I'm just saying, how about we cut it off to help Americans already here now, the people who live here now. So in your book, you, you talk a lot about also the demographics of winning in terms of conservatism. And you mentioned earlier how you know, Romney would have obviously won an overwhelming victory if it hadn't been for the inundation of people of different populations who have been brought in by the 65 Act. Let me ask you from the Michael Medved perspective, because Michael takes the opposite perspective, and he and I have had this debate ourselves. He, he, Michael will, will argue that we have to do comprehensive immigration reform, we, we should be softer on the border, uh, we, should, we should do all of this, and, and we should bring in more immigrants and find a pathway to citizenship, specifically because if we don't do this, then the Hispanic population in the United States is the fastest growing population, even just through natural growth and birth. What do we do in 20, 30 years to win elections as the white population of the United States, which historically votes Republican, decreases? Um, well, a couple of things. I don't know how we could be any softer on the border. 
Perhaps we could fly them in directly from Central America. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Obama is doing that. You know, he's doing that. We are flying them in so they don't have to go through that arduous journey through Mexico, uh, <laughs> handing them a voter's registration card. Um, point two, I mean, it is certainly the case right now that um, if 71% of Hispanics had voted Republican in the 2012 election, Mitt Romney still would have lost. If 4% more whites had voted Republican, Romney would have won. Um, and the analogy, not analogy, but the point I guess I make in my book is to California in 1994. The demographics of the entire country about, are about what they were in California in 1994 when Pete Wilson won a huge come from behind victory by tying himself with titanium cords to Proposition 187, an anti-illegal immigration measure. Would have cut illegal immigrants off from getting any government services. That, and to go back to how mass immigration of low-skilled workers not popular with with black Americans um, Proposition 187 won a majority of blacks, of whites, of Asians, 30 percent of Hispanics uh, even people who were voting for the Democrat were voting for Proposition 187. Uh, Pete Wilson got 20 percent of the black vote that year across the country he got or the average among congressional Republicans was only 8 percent so there's your path to victory, Republicans, and then you've got to shut it down because point three, well, okay, then, then we're, just, we're just, I don't know, fiddling on the Titanic because Hispanics don't care about, about amnesty. They're in. Right. They're already in, and of, of all the issues, we're not going to win the Hispanics. Also, this idea... This idea that there's some sort of Hispanic unity is something believed exclusively by white liberals. And the RNC, apparently. <laughs> I'm, talk to your maids once in a while. No, the Dominicans <laughs> hate the Puerto Ricans, the Mexicans hate the blacks. There's no, no, there is no unity here. The reason immigrants post-1970 have been voting overwhelmingly for the Democrats is because they're poor, they're in need of gov government services, they come from one-party states, they are used to block voting for a particular group. I mean, as I say, the People's Revolutionary Party of Mexico ruled Mexico for 71 years. Just, you know, tell me what... Tell me what the symbol is. I have to go vote for and I'll go do it. The reason we have poor people voting for Democrats is, is because that's what they do. And it's not just poor people. I mean, and it's not just, um, um, it's not just brown people. Uh, look at Piers Morgan if you want to see how immigrants would vote. <laughs> And by definition, any immigrant to America makes America more statist and less free because we are the freest country in the world. I mean, it's like any immigrant to Finland makes Finland less white. It's just, you know, a definitional matter. And when people move, I'm, look at poor Vermont. It used to be rock-ribbed Republican Vermont. A bunch of New Yorkers moved up there, and now they have Bernie Sanders as a senator. Uh, a lot of states has fl have flipped when New Yorkers have moved <laughs> into them. Maybe we should build a fence around New York. <laughs> no, you guys. But uh, the point is you always think, and yes, there are some immigrants who, who, who are coming and, 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 and want to vote like an American, as I say in the book, who, who don't need 60 years of seeing what the Democrats do. They understand them right away. They start voting Republican right away. Glad to have you. That's 20% of them. Most of them are bringing their, their statist politics with them, and they, they're going to get more benefits under the Democrats than they will under Republicans. That is why they're voting for Democrats, not because we're mean about having a border. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in your book, one of the things that you talk about at length, and I thought this was fascinating because I had no idea about this, and I'm pretty up on these things, is the, is the, the complete lack of government statistics <laughs> when it comes to illegal immigrant crime. Because you, you figure that should be a very easy thing to look up. And then in your book, as you detail, it's almost impossible <laughs> to find any real government statistics on this stuff. Yes, yes. Well, this is, this is a good, one of the advantages of doing my own research, that this book wasn't going to be a book about immigration. I had a great idea for a book, which, by the way, I still think is a great idea for a book. Um, and I'd written a couple of chapters, at least drafted them, and I get to my immigration chapter, and I go to look up, you know, basic obvious facts, how many immigrants are in prison. 
two weeks, two weeks of looking, and I'm a fanatical researcher, the Census Department, the Department of Justice, the Bureau of Prisons, which has to be pretty good on these things because they have to keep the diff different gangs separated. So they really need to know. They have a reason to know. Um, I look in the New York Times and Nexus, and has anybody argued about this? And everybody's arguing about wild guesses by the government. They refuse to tell us. And every time I'd come across a government report that seemed to be, this is what I mean, about the first line of Anna Karenina, they, uh, the, the truth truth is always the same. The lies are lies in their own ways. Um, so you'd have to, you start reading the report. I think, hallelujah, here it is, a report titled, you know, immigrants, how many immigrants are in prison? And then you start reading the report and, oh, um, every year except 1925, Hispanics are counted as white. That's one report. Another one, the GAO, I mean, the congressional investigators had to ask the GAO to count, to tell us because the Department of Justice didn't have it, the Bureau of Prisons didn't have it. Um, so the GAO, they've done a couple of massive investigations, but on closer examination, they're counting illegal and legal uh, immigrants, which I think we should do, in the federal prison, but in the must, much larger state system, they're counting only illegal immigrants, only illegal immigrants for whom the states have re requested reimbursement, um, only illegal immigrants for whom the states have requested reimbursement who have committed at least one felony or two misdemeanors. Um, you know, we're not getting anchor babies. We're not getting the children of, of the one, or the ones, not even the children, but the ones amnestied by, by Reagan. No, I want to know. We're, I think we have a right to know, and I think the last few weeks now that, thank you Donald Trump, he's brought it to the fore and the shooting in San Francisco, people are, are thinking, yeah, how many are there? Um, incidentally, I spent the weekend and a lot of money um, looking up these reports. I don't know if you've, yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've seen some of this. Liberals keep aggressively asserting on TV, well, studies show immigrants commit less crime than Americans do. Now. I know that's not true. What I don't know is how they're lying. So I wanted to know, and I try to get the reports. Um, uh, well, first of all, you, you ought to be suspicious that one of the arguments they're making is, well, New York City has a lot of immigrants, and I don't see a lot of crime here. That's not a study. <laughs> that's not science. It's retarded. Um, and, you know, Geraldo was making that argument with me, and Geraldo is not a stupid man, so the facts must not be very good. Uh, but anyway, I try looking for the, for the studies, and I put in, sometimes you'd get a reference to the name of a researcher. And then I was looking on Nexus to try to see, what, wh where are these studies, can I see what they're saying? And you'll get a professor from such and such a university, well, I just did a study, and it turns out, uh, first generation immigrants commit far less crime than Americans. But they're all hidden, you, I, so I'd, tra I'd track down the study, they're all hidden behind paywalls. And you know, I'm already paying for Scribd, for Nexus, for <laughs> yeah, a, a billion different services. So first I wasted two hours thinking, come on, you're not going to make me pay $50 for this crap ass study. But yeah, <laughs> I had to keep paying $50 just so I could skim down, find out what the lie is, which is what I'm probably going to tell you all about in my column this week, but I'll tell you right now. They are not looking at Americans. They are looking at criminal Americans. Yep. I mean, they have different ways of doing it, um, but one guy, and the big headline, and he's being quoted in the Dallas Morning News and the New York Times, well, my study showed first-generation immigrants, far less crime than, than, than Americans, the native-born Americans. So then you see what he looked at. He's looking at the trajectory, as he says. Um, so he, the, the base population were juvenile offenders. So this is someone who has already been convicted of a crime, which he admits, well, my base, my base study began with 45% blacks, 33% Hispanics, and 15% whites. That's not a, that's not a cross-section of America. <laughs> that's a cross-section of our criminal pro population. The other ones will, you know, pick a, a city at random and look at the native-born Americans versus immigrants. Let's take Detroit. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. Do you think I'm not going to point out that the black underclass has a very high crime rate? Because I'm going to point it out. <laughs> um, no, I'm thinking we want immigrants to have, um, to not just beat the black crime rate. I want them beating the Norwegian crime rate. <laughs> 
I mean, why should any, I'm skipping all past this, all lies, I'm skipping past this to get to the point, why are any criminals coming in? No, we have our own criminals. We don't need more. Because, the, again, the topic sentence on any discussion about immigration, it is a government policy like any other. It ought to be used to benefit the people here. If you are bringing in a child molest, one child molester, one drunk driver, one person who needs government services, or English language lessons that are going to have to be paid for by the taxpayers, that is not helping the people already here. I mean, there's ones they keep talking about, you know, the hardworking ones that don't commit crimes and, you know, they're working so hard and, and supporting their family of four and sending half of their $8 an hour salary home and, you know, that's fantastic, they're very admirable. But how does it help America? No, it doesn't. They're using schools and services and hospitals and medical ser services and, f and the housing aid and they're sending we are, immigrants to America, both legal and illegal, are sending $20 billion back to Mexico every year. That's funding Carlos Slim, who saved the New York Times from bankruptcy, <laughs> another chapter in my book. You know, Carlos Slim makes money off of immigration, especially illegal immigration, to the United States. $20 billion, that is a cost of immigration you will never be told about. $20 billion being sucked out of the American economy, that is money that will never be used to buy an Ameri American product, to hire an American worker, um, to purchase an American house, or tip an American um, you know, busboy. No, that is just being sucked out of the American economy. We ought to just, you know, tax Americans. I mean, it takes a circuitous route from t American taxpayers to the U.S. government to the low-wage immigrants who need the support from the taxpayers. That's why they can take those low-wage jobs, who, you know, lives in an apartment with five other immigrants and then sends it back to Chiapas, his grandmother, who, who then buys Carlos Slim products. Carlos Slim owns 40 percent of the companies on the Mexican stock exchange, so he needs that money in Mexico. They then buy a Carlos Slim um, product and it goes into Carlos Slim's pocket. So why, do, why don't, can we just, you know, write a check to Carlos Slim? <laughs> So uh, for, for people who don't know, and I didn't know until I read your book, Anne, uh, the, the, can you tell the kind of the story of American immigration? Because you, you referenced it earlier, you know, obviously for me, as a Jew, that means that my great-great-grandparents got here in 1907, I believe. And, and so it's, the easy thing is to buy into illegal immigration bad, legal immigration exactly. good, because my grandparents and great-grandparents came legally. Exactly. Can you explain why that is no longer the case, why even legal immigration needs to be curtailed? Yes, and by the way, you, your people are great other than the way they vote. <laughs> hey, the, you the, really the, and the lot ones, of brains, the, really helps the country. Uh, the ones who vote that way ain't my people. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, it used to be, as Ben and I'm sure his grandparents are an example, pre-1970, immigrants were, as any immigration policy would require, better than us. That's what we want. We want immigrants way better than us. Um, immigrants pre-1970 were more educated, made more money, bought more houses, and 30% of them went home. Just take that fact alone. 30% of them couldn't make it and went home. We sk looked out across the world and skimmed the cream from the rest of the world. Pope, unfortunately, the 1965 Act came at the same time as the Great Society programs when America was transferred, transformed into a massive welfare state. Well, that is obviously going to change not only the sort of immigrant you're getting, um, well, the 1965 Act did that through a series of complicated rules to bring in people from, as cult from cultures as different from ours as possible and as poor as possible, because again, they'll work for the They'll work for the rich and they'll vote Democrat. Uh, nobody goes home. Why would anybody go home? Go on welfare. And they are voting eight to two for the Democrats. So what do we do about the H-1B visa issue? Because you talk uh, about this. Because they're, they, one of the, like Ted Cruz is very good on immigration, except for, legal. according to you, legal immigration and H-1B visas. H-1B visas are high-tech visas for people who don't pay attention to this stuff very closely. So can you explain the problem with the H-1B visa process and why even that needs to be curtailed according to your book? Yes, yes. Um, 
a lot of Republicans get stuck on this issue, so I won't, I won't attack Ted Cruz for it because so many people. I mean, I, I keep having to. I'm going to have to get like a, a shot caller for Sean Hannity and a few other people who interview <laughs> me because they keep talking about illegal immigration. Other than the first chapter of my book where I talk about amnesty, because that just ends the country overnight. Then it's then it's lights out. Um, the rest of my book is, is, doesn't particularly distinguish. Uh, the Hmong immigrants up here in Fresno and out in Minnesota engaging in massive amounts of, of human smuggling, child rape, um, credit card theft, shooting hunters because they don't understand <laughs> private property. This is explained with great sensitivity in the Minnesota papers. No, they're all legal immigrants. The Somalis voting for Al Franken and then going back to fight with ISIS, they're all legal. Um, no, we are talking about the legal immigrants coming in and the H-1B visas in particular are the ones that most Republicans have a soft spot for, mostly because we are lied to about, oh, there's just so, so, so high IQ, they have such gigantic brains. Incidentally, the only time I mention IQ in my book is to quote the ones who want the cheap labor on the H-1. Oh, they have such high IQs. It's just stunning. Um, no, H-1B visas are being used, um, well, in, in the worst cases, to bring in concubines for Bali Reddy, Lucky Reddy, one of our model immigrants in San Francisco. He bought 12-year-old girls from their parents for sex, brought them in on H-1B visas. One died. Um, this uh, happened... I don't know, it's in the book, like 2001, 2002. I follow the news very closely. <laughs> when I came across this, I called up my, my friends, um, many of whom also follow the news closely, and said, hey, did you hear about this case in San Francisco? An Indian immigrant bringing in 12-year-old girls he had bought from their parents for sex, which ended up sex with all of them at once. Um, he also brought in his, his busboys. He had um, a lot of... Um, restaurants and real estate property. That story was not broken by the San Francisco Chronicle. In fact, both the police and the media brushed it under the rug. It was broken by a high school journalism class. They had not yet attended Columbia Journalism School and did not know. No, it's, v it's against our journalistic practice to report facts that are unpleasant about our model immigrants. Um, so he's bringing in, you know, busboys, janitors, and concubines under the H-1B. There's, there's one category of how it's an utter fraud. Other, ca other category, um, even the ones who are doing the computer programming work. Well, no, they're not the stars. They're doing standard computer programming work. Uh, they're, unfortunately, you know, Americans could do the same work, but they want to be paid. The way the H-1B visa works is it's tied to a particular employer. So if you come in to work for Mark Zuckerberg, and then, um, you know, PayPal gives you a, a better offer, uh, you can't leave without risking losing your, your visa. So you're tied to a particular employer. It's, well, it's what's known in, in the law as indentured servitude, which this country abolished 100 years ago. Well, now the rich are bringing it back. And, you know, we keep telling college students, oh, you've got to major in, in one of the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, math. Well, no, the STEM graduates, American STEM graduates, half of them are not employed in STEM fields. And their, their salaries haven't gone up for a decade now. Why? Because Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg are bringing in the computer programmers that, who can do regular. They just type away in their little cubby holes for 12 hours, collapse, go home, and go to sleep. It is just a scam for the rich. Well, on the free trade side of that, there could be a counter-argument from the free trade side, which would be, okay, so if you don't do that, if you don't bring the immigrants from there, then they just relocate to India and they outsource like they've done to call centers, for example. So what, what is the counter to the free trade argument? Okay, well, we're, we're, I understand you're worried about American wages, but American companies could just leave and relocate in Hong Kong and, and hire everybody there for cheap wages. They could. I don't think they would. We'll see. <laughs> but I've... Um, the reason I even knew to look... Uh, <laughs> because I kept reading about these high IQ, high IQ, it's mostly Indians writing about Indians being the, the wonder, the stars of Silicon Valley. So one thing Indians don't have a problem with is self-esteem. Um, <laughs> but the reason I even knew to look was because one of my friends um, was, who runs a company was thinking of relocating his call centers, as probably many of you have <laughs> discovered, to India. Um, and he was the one who told me that India has a very flat 
bell curve, and that's why I looked up. What is the average Indian IQ? No, we, we by and large meet the smart ones. It's about the same as, I don't know, like Panama, the Sudan. It really isn't. This is just more low-wage work, work for, for the poor. And as for the trade issue particularly, I don't know, I think you might want to get them here, and it's not worth the trouble of having them over there. And, um, but to the extent that happens, I don't know. Okay, so That's uh, another issue. Somebody else can, can deal with that, <laughs> but I know Americans aren't getting the jobs. I mean, I, I, I don't have a strong position on free trade. That's never been my thing. Okay. So as I a, think it becomes kind of, a, I'm, I'm suspicious because the same people, um, because it's the same people who are so obsessed with all the, who have been lying to me for 20 years about immigration, who say we need, um, we need these trade deals like NAFTA. So I, I never really thought the sine qua non of being a conservative was making sure um, Mark Zuckerberg makes more money. Okay, so with regards to the media, because you've referenced it a few times, one of the criticisms that your book has gotten is that there's so much anecdotal evidence, which is because, as you stated, it's impossible to find statistics because they don't exist. But I, I did a little bit of research on the, uh, on the shooting that just happened up in San Francisco, and for the first two days of the shooting, the, uh, the shooter was referred to only by his name of Texas. Francisco Sanchez of Texas. Yes. And so I wanted you to talk a little bit about how the media tends to treat these stories when they originally see them. Oh, because yes. Because it's amazing. Well, what's interesting about the San Francisco case is that we did find out by hook or crook, um, it was generally mentioned in the articles um, about Texas man. <laughs> <laughs> um, it generally was at least mentioned he had already been deported four times. Um, in my extensive research, I only found two other cases. I'm or two cases, and now this one, where we found out very early on that the illegal immigrant who killed an American was an illegal immigrant, though the headline may still have been Texas man. Um, the other one was uh, the Porky's director, uh, who was driving in Pacific Palisades with his 22-year-old son, and a drunk illegal alien swerved straight into his lane, smashed him, killed him and his son. Immediately, the illegal alien and his passenger were fine. Um, and I thought, and I, there, were, there were articles, the LA Times was saying it was an illegal alien. Um, and I, you know, emailed some of my friends in Hollywood and said, what, wh why would this come, wh wh and I don't know, maybe it's just they considered Porky such a reprehensible movie that anyone who <laughs> killed the director, it doesn't reflect that badly on the illegal, but that one came out. And the other one happened a year earlier. It was an actress in, the, in her West Village apartment, uh, Adrienne Shelley. Uh, and she was, she was murdered by an illegal alien, and immediately, as soon as he was arrested a week later, immediately we all knew. And the only thing that separates those cases from most of the cases I write about is that they all happen in places where liberals might be. So I go back to my point that, you know, oh no, the rich are perfectly willing to pay the costs of bringing in peasant cultures. That's because they don't pay the cost. No, they move their, their maids out to the suburbs. And they come in to clean the house and then go back and, and fill up your schools and your hospitals and rape your kids. So in your book, one of the, one of the big issues, obviously, that, that you take on also, uh, aside from the, the sort of media bias, is, uh, is the fecklessness of the GOP on this issue. Why do you think that the GOP is pathologically incapable of taking on this issue in any real way? Um, I used to think it was cowardice. I now think it is pure stupidity. <laughs> Pure stupidity. Um, it's a hell of a and choice actually, there. <laughs> I guess, yes, it could, could be so many things. Um, and actually, if I could just get back to one other thing. The anecdotal examples aren't to prove the point. Chapter 7 is where you'll see, that was the chapter written through tears of frustration and rage of how I describe. I, you know, you go looking for basic crime facts. I mean, I think I do have some pretty good facts mm -hmm. that aren't anecdotal. The U.S. Marshal's most wanted list. <laughs> Take a look at that one. Um, New York State prisons, uh, they, they used to count, because again, prisons really do have to know. They may not, they may not publish it, but they do have to know the diff different ethnic groups because they get into huge gang brawls in the prisons. Um, and, and so I have a list of, of where, where people are from from the New York prisons. I think that's pretty devastating. The main way I use the anecdotes isn't to prove the point, it's to attack the media. 
it's it's just mind-boggling how they hide. I have these, you know, sprinkled throughout the book, these Spot the Immigrant chapters, where I'll give you the mainstream media article and, you know, my comments throughout, and, you know, you're completely convinced that, um, you know, it's some farm boys up in, up in Fresno who have, who have gang-raped these little 14-year-old girls, and only when you read the court transcripts three years later, oh my gosh, they're all Hmong! <laughs> Why couldn't you tell us that? The San Francisco case I mentioned with model immigrant Bali Reddy, Lucky Reddy. Um, that story was never mentioned in the New York Times. Never, never, never. How much ink has the New York Times spent on rapes that didn't happen by the Duke lacrosse team and UVA? How much ink was wasted on Ferguson? where Big Mike did not put his hands up and say, hands up, don't shoot. But actual cases of shocking, heinous gang rapes, incest rapes, child rapes going on in American communities, and for no reason, the media won't tell us about this. The Mexican gang rape case, it's one of the most hideous stories I've ever read. And again, I called my friends who follow not only the news, but crime as much as I do, and they did not know about this case. Uh, it, it, it started, I think, before the, in the Clinton administration, ended during the Bush administration, and just the ugliest, most shocking um, gang rape of two little girls in Texas, led by an illegal alien, did a full nexus search. The case went on for about a decade. Never, never was illegal immigrant, immigrant or Mexican mentioned in relation to the main gang rapist, and this was the largest number of death penalty cases in Texas, which isn't shy about the death penalty, for about a half century. It was a pretty big case. There, there was one article in the New York Times about the case, but never did our media mention Mexican immigrant, much less illegal immigrant from Mexico, until they used the fact that the lead rapist was a Mexican to try to spring him from the death penalty. That is the first time ten years later. And the full description of the first mention I found was, in a Texas case. That's how you're going to describe one of the most brutal gang rapes I've ever read about. So the point of all the anecdotal evidence isn't to prove the crime point, it's to prove our media is shockingly corrupt and lying to you, and you are going to have to demand information about immigration if we're ever going to get it. And back to the stupidity on the Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, after the, the fact that Trump has struck such a chord, do any of them have eyes? Don't they want to win? This is apparently a popular topic. I gave a, 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 a speech out in Ontario, California last week, and I, I didn't realize, I mean, I, you know, they're nice people like you. I, I'm, some of you might be Cruz supporters, Walker announced today. Um, if any of you are Rubio supporters, we'll have a little chat about that. <laughs> uh, but I mentioned, in, in, during the question and answer, I mentioned my fondness for Donald Trump, and the room exploded. They were so happy. It was 100% for Trump. Um, and, I mean, I can't say I believe he's going to be the nominee. If, for those of you who follow my work assiduously, you know that I'm constantly saying Republicans don't get distracted by someone who hasn't been a governor or at least a senator. It's not going to be the nominee. I don't know with Trump. If none of these Republicans pick up on this, it's just wide open there. And I wish, I'm, you know my secret, my secret plan, and this comes out in the last chapter of my book, the one guy with a 20-year fantastic record on immigration is Mitt Romney. And I was very disappointed when he criticized Donald Trump, <laughs> my new hero. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when Romney comes in on the hang glider right into the middle of the race as the 17th candidate on that stage and just bumps Rick Santorum off, it'll be amusing. I'm thinking people will see that debate and think, oh, man, Romney was the best we ever had it. <laughs> Maybe he could take Trump as his vice presidential nominee. <laughs> but look, I mean, if it is Jeb Bush or Rubio, I'm not saying this in an angry or threatening way, you'd have to vote for Rubio, or rather for Hillary, over those two. They are sole objective 
is Jeb and Rubio, their sole objective is to open the border and pass amnesty, at least with Hillary. She wants to socialize any other industries that haven't been socialized. She wants to lose wars for us abroad. <laughs> she wants to take your children away, make, you know, abortion mandatory. Um, <laughs> Gay marriage mandatory, perhaps. There are a lot of items on her agenda. Whereas Jeb and Rubio single-mindedly focused <laughs> on opening the border and, and, and passing amnesty. Uh, so if, if Trump isn't the nominee, uh, I hope he does. I, I mean, if, if it's Jeb or Rubio, I hope he does run as a third party candidate. So, there's some, so I can make it clear what my, my vote is about. In 2014, a lot of people voted specifically about this topic, and this was the deciding topic, and I heard a, a very prominent member of the Wall Street Journal editorial team assure an entire room at least twice this size that th that topic was not even at issue in the 2014 <laughs> election. Um, and the, the question is, what, do, what should Republicans have done? What should they do? Let's say that... God forbid Hillary Clinton wins or it's somebody else on the Republican side who doesn't care about this issue, but there are people in Congress, let's say the Republicans hold Congress. What should they do right now, for example, to stop Barack Obama's executive amnesty that they didn't do at the beginning of the year? Um, well, they shouldn't fund it. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> uh, but first of all, let's let's... Just quickly take the point, what was the 2014 election about? Tom Cotton in Arkansas beat a popular sitting Democratic senator by running against him on Obama's executive amnesty. Uh, ben Sass in Nebraska took out a field of candidates that I'm sure were very popular with the Wall Street Journal, businessmen who, who think that, you know, um, Amnesty is a fine idea. Um, ben Sass lapped both of them. He got more than the two of them combined. And of course, there was the famous election of, of Dave Bratt uh, in Virginia taking out, for the first time in history, a member of the leadership of Congress. Oh, and I'd also throw in here Scott Brown in Massachusetts, whom if we were, you know, ranking races by level of difficulty, um, you know, the rest of them are doing somersaults compared to this guy who has to do, you know, a triple layover and flip off the, off the shallow end of the pool. It was, uh, Scott Brown came, did incredibly well by raising the amnesty issue. It is popular with voters. It is not popular with, unfortunately, the most of the people who control the media. Um, and and when, the, when the defunding of Obama's executive amnesty came up, the Republicans did try to fight it, and the Democrats did filibuster it for three weeks. But unless you were reading Breitbart, you didn't know about it. <laughs> um, there was just no media attention to it. Uh, and now I... They've betrayed us on trade. My objection to the trade deal is it's a backdoor amnesty. It allows not only the free movement of goods, but the free movement of people. So, so a company can say, well, I need so many low-wage workers coming in to take these jobs. Um, I, Republicans have a winning issue here uh, if they would just talk about it. And, and look, the Ann Coulter rule is there, there are a lot of bad Republicans. There are no good Democrats. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are a fair number of, ver of, of Republicans in both the House and the Senate who are fantastic on amnesty, and we need to push them and elevate them, and people need to be more like them. And what? I also think we should take out one. This is what we mm -hmm. as voters can do. Um, they should stop being stupid. Um, <laughs> I think we only need to take out one of these guys. Maybe John Boehner. Just one of them. And again, as you know, if you assiduously follow my work, I harangued all of you to vote for the Republican don't go for the Tea Party candidate because really bad things happen when Democrats control the Congress. But. Um, I mean, that's why the Brat thing was fantastic, and, and a lot of these Tea Party candidates, I, I'm not even sure I believe half of them, but they're not that good. They haven't run for anything before. We need to find a place where there is a good candidate to challenge a bad Republican. And, and that, um, as Voltaire said in Candide, we hang one to encourage the others. <laughs> <laughs> So now I'm going to ask the apocalyptic question, which I know everybody, every Republican at this point has felt, which is, okay, what happens if we can't actually do anything? Because it feels like on every front, the President of the United States is doing whatever the hell he wants. There yeah. is no rule of law anymore. The Supreme Court 
obviously does not care about the rule of law. They're doing whatever they please. Congress is willing to abdicate whatever authority it has. Mm -hmm. They're just handing over the cash. So what do citizens do, and how fast is this going to turn very ugly? That's a good question. Um, I don't think it will turn any uglier than it is. I just feel like most Americans are hunkered down hoping it will all go away. But it's not going to go away and the winning path to follow is Pete Wilson in 1994. Uh, and and l look, it, it's, it's Americans who have shut down three amnesties in the last decade. It wasn't because, you know, some major uh, network or newspaper was alerting you to it. The American people would somehow, by cr hook or crook, find out, oh my gosh, they're doing it again. They're trying to pass an amnesty. And they, uh, three times now, shut down the congressional switchboard. Well, you, you may have to shut down your newspaper switchboards or your, your TV network switchboards and make it clear this is what we want to hear about because this is all that matters in so many ways. And even to the Democrats, I'd say, I mean, I'm assuming this is a Republican audience. That's why I talk about how it is just... It's the end of the Republican Party nationally. We might have a few seats in Montana, Idaho. Are they moving any of the unaccompanied ch children there? But, but I mean, the whole country will be California uh, without the beautiful beaches, attractive people. <laughs> You'll all be the Kardashians. It'll be awful. Um, <laughs> But you, there, this is the, even if you are a Democrat, this is going to change our country in such a fundamental way. We will be like Brazil, and I think it'll just happen slowly, and you'll wake up one day, and, uh, you know, after election after election, that's fine. We will have, we won't even be as good as Mexico, because Mexico has the advantage of living next to the most wealthy country in the world. No, we will be Brazil with a very, very wealthy 10, 20 percent and a very, very poor uh, 80 or 90 percent. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's not only the freest country that's ever existed, but what, what always set America apart, and California, I would say particularly, was our enormous, prosperous middle class. Enormous. I always think that's why um, um, my theory of why the ugly American image developed in Europe, um, because most of the Europeans, most of the people you meet from, from foreign countries will, you know, fly across an ocean to come to America. We only meet their elites. No, not, not Americans. Everybody used to travel to Europe. Not now. We're all worried about paying rent, holding on to your job, paying for, for all of those, you know, special English translators at the schools, paying to support your hospital from going bankrupt. I mean, this is just so crushing to the middle class. But it's good for Mark Zuckerberg. It's good for the rich. It's good for the rich farmers with all that cheap labor because they refuse to mechanize. So here we are in California, which is, as you mentioned, sort of the bottom of the hill. Um, what exactly are Californians supposed to do? I get this question a lot because we just, for the first time, passed. We, we are now a, a plurality Hispanic state, uh, and we are, we are now minority white state, which means that I suppose that pretty soon I, my kids can, can apply for affirmative action, which is exciting right. for the first time. I don't think it's um, going to work that way. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunate. <laughs> it, worked for, it worked for Jews for like this long, and then it was gone. But um, so what we, aside from using our lives to serve as a warning for others, what right, exactly right, should right. Californians do at this point? That's a good question. <laughs> wow. Huh. <laughs> This is not an encouraging pause. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, I think it's you're just a warning for others. <laughs> I don't see anything else that can be done. Well, I mean, I suppose, I mean, obviously, alert the, alert the rest of us where it's still time in the rest of the states, but also I wonder, I mean, my prescriptions for the country, um, triple layer fence, I want it to be as difficult to get into the United States as it used to be to get out of East Germany. I'm so sick of hearing fences don't work. <laughs> it's like, shoelaces, they just don't work. 
What? <laughs> what are you talking about? Of course they were. Yeah. Oh, they cannot come untied. I know the human spirit. Uh, <laughs> Um, my long-term plan, which um, would be fantastic for Israel, is to move them to the northern por portion of Mexico. Um, I have a chapter, Why Can't We Have Israel's Policy on Immigration? That's a country that knows how to defend its borders. Um, that would be good for them, good for us, fantastic for us. Um, they'd have us, their biggest best buddy in the whole world, right next to them on one whole, one whole side. Um, well, Obama's presidents are not for long on that one. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, we have to get rid of the anchor baby policy. I also think we need to repeal. I want it. I want it retroactive. Incidentally, in the news all now is this El Chapo, the biggest drug cartel leader. He's in my book. Um, he's married to an anchor baby uh, who a couple of years ago flew back to California to give birth to her own two anchor babies um, as soon as, at your expense. Um, as soon as she had given birth to her two anchor babies, she flew right back to join El Chapo uh, who is who replaced I think Osama bin Laden on Interpol and the FBI's most wanted list and hmm how did he escape from prison? Well because in Mexico the cartels own the prisons. Forget California, that's your future America. Um, so as I describe in my book, is that the anchor baby policy was a footnote in a Justice Brennan opinion in 1982. This does not go back to you know the Reconstruction Amendments. The 14th Amendment was about one thing, again, utterly insulting to black Americans. The 14th Amendment, hmm, why was that passed? So that someday La Raza could usher across Mexican women who were eight and a half months pregnant, they could drop a baby and say, ha, ah, you didn't catch me, I'm an American citizen now. No, it, uh, people don't put trap doors in a constitution. Uh, a secret trap door. Ooh, this will surprise them. Um, to get an amendment passed, you need a mass feeling about a, a big thing. We had just fought a civil war to force, again, the Democrats to stop enslaving blacks. Um, that The 14th Amendment is absolutely exclusively about black Americans. That's what it's about. And by the way, it's not about gay marriage either. But... <laughs> <laughs> They're at least gay Americans. <laughs> Here we're talking about people who've never set foot on U.S. soil before playing a game of Red Rover with our Border Patrol for the most precious possession in the universe, citizenship in this country. No, that is not how you get American citizenship. But Justice Brennan... This only came in 1982. 1982, Justice Brennan slipped it in a footnote of a 1982 opinion. It is utterly outrageous, um, fraudulent. Uh, Justice, or j rather Judge Richard Posner, whom as you can attest, very smart, most cited federal judge, not a friend of social conservatives. <laughs> so this, this isn't, you know, me speaking. Um, a few years ago, I quote him in the book, he concurred in an, in an immigration opinion for the sole purpose of adding a concurrence that, that said, Congress, would you end this anchor baby policy? It's not in the Constitution. Pass a law tomorrow and end it. It's not only got to be ended, but, and this would save California. I want it retroactive. Mm. <laughs> I mean, this. What, uh, what if we had a mentally delusional Supreme Court justice? <laughs> Not that hard to imagine. Who says, you know, all of America or all of the world is a citizen of America? Are, are we all going to honor that? Because that's what's happened with the anger baby policy. Um, Just make sure Kennedy takes his drugs this morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, what if we had A? I guess that was. Um, so anchor baby policy, the wall. Um, oh, yeah, no, the, the moratorium. We need a complete mor immigration moratorium. So this isn't, just about, this isn't just about Latin America. It isn't just about Mexico. I don't want European immigrants coming. I don't want anybody coming. No marriage, no, no refugees, no asylees. Just shut it down for 10 years, and you'll see. I explain it toward the end of my book. My original idea was let's go back to pre-1970 rules and try to get. As I say, people are better than us that, rather than people who are worse than us. But that 
won't work because we have all these nonprofits. We have hundreds of, you know, ACLU migrant rights groups and George Soros Open Society Institute and La Raza, founded by the Ford Foundation, incidentally, not by Hispanics um, like LULAC was. Um, we have hundreds of these groups. I do a paragraph that goes on for a full page of just some of them, and those are all the ones who become the immigration judges. Those are all the ones who work at the INS until they are all out of business and vacationing in, you know, Cuba and fighting with the the Tupac uh, um, Amaru in in Peru. Until they are gone. America can't be safe, so we need to just shut down immigration altogether for a decade, dust off the books, assimilate the ones already here, and then we can start it up again totally cheap. I could do it all before breakfast. <laughs> just send me the photos. I'd be right 99% of the time. I'd be better than what we're getting now 100% of the time. <laughs> Ann Coulter, 11-time New York Times bestselling author. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. What do we do, Lee?